Welcome to Doors to Hope and Healing, an inside look at the many facets of work that is happening at the Department of Children and Families, between our staff, the families we serve, and our community partners. My name is Jacqueline Ford. I have had the honor of working for the department for almost 30 years. And although I may be familiar with many of the topics we bring to you, I have invited experts in those fields to help us dispel the myths and misconceptions that can often be barriers to our work. Join us as we open our doors and invite you to have a seat at our table. Hi, welcome to Doors to Hope and Healing. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Um, this show is all about dispelling the myths and misconceptions that surround the Department of Children and Families. Um, so knowing that we're soon planning a Send a Family to Camp, I thought this would be a great opportunity for us all to be on set and to talk with our viewers about the way we're all collaborating together to help families get to camp and to relieve them of some stressors and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes but before we get into the reason we're here and the topic we're talking about if we could introduce yourselves um, to our viewers and just share a little bit about you know your role at either the police department or probation and you know what you're doing um, with the families and youth so we can start with with you hi thank you Jackie uh, my name is Joshua Berniger I'm the chief of police at the Watertown Police Department and I'm representing the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association here today. Thank you for being here. Hey, Jackie, uh, Lieutenant Ryan Bissett with the Waterbury Police Department. Uh, I oversee our community relations program, which is, includes our Police Activity League, which is a great partner in this collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Jackie, I'm Marissa Hi. Sullivan. Um, I work with the Judicial Branch. I've been there for 18 years, mm -hmm. and I'm currently a juvenile probation officer, and I've been there for about 16 years. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. It's been a pleasure to be on this committee that we've been on, and I thought, you know, as each week um, progresses and how we're really reaching that goal of what we intended, I thought it would be a good time to come on the show and talk about it in hopes that what we're doing can be, you know, really replicated through every community in our state. So let's start with you, Ryan. Can you tell us a little bit more about PAL and what, what PAL is for people? who aren't familiar with that acronym. So PAL is the, for Waterbury, it's the Police Activities League, but generally speaking, some places, the Police Athletic League. Mm -hmm. um, our PAL program is one of the largest in the country. We have close to 3,000 members. We have a campus in Waterbury, which I'd encourage everyone if they have a chance at some point to uh, stop by any time and visit. But the main purpose behind PAL is, is to build positive relationships between cops and kids. And um, we, we have officers assigned. Right now, there's four officers assigned full-time to our program, along with a combination of civilian staff, and uh, we have numerous officers that volunteer and coach and are involved in PAL in various capacities. Uh, we do everything from sports to culinary to summer employment to camps to aftercare programs. We have a fleet of buses. We, we drive kids to and from programs. We really just embed ourselves uh, in the community, in these children's lives, and try to build relationships with kids at a young age so as they grow older, they have a, a trusting relationship with police. Mm -hmm. They see police in a different context outside of traditional settings, mm -hmm. and they can build that foundation. And are there other PALs throughout the state? There are. There are numerous uh, PALs throughout Connecticut, throughout the country. We fall under the umbrella of, of National PAL, mm -hmm. um, and uh, th th there's uh, many PALs throughout the entire country. And from what I understand, PAL is a nonprofit. It's it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, it is separate from the police department, but there's a, a strong uh, relationship um, with the police department and the city of Waterbury where they provide services such as the Waterbury police officers in kind mm -hmm. to help run that program and to build those relationships with the kids. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. And do you find that through your work at PAL, there is a difference with the youth that are involved with your program as far as you know getting in any kind of trouble or not having a trusting relationship with the police. Uh, absolutely, Jackie. Uh, many kids find a home there. Um, we serve an underprivileged population and um, we, we, we really try to make our programs 
is available to everybody. There's a nominal cost, and if you can't afford that cost, we'll waive that fee. Our goal is to get kids in the door, mm -hmm. to provide a safe environment, to build positive relationships, and really surround ourselves with, with partners such as DCI Probation, Chiefs of Police Association, to have those wraparound services for these kids and get them everything that they need. And also at the same time, you know, have a bond with the family, the parents, and, and build that relationship to show that the police, we do have our job, we, we make our arrests, we do what we do, but we, we, we care about the family and we want to you know, do what we can to help the community. Well, thank you. I think that it's phenomenal, and, and I do hope that you know more police departments across the state can replicate that as well. Josh, can you talk about the Police Chiefs Association? I know that you're here, you know, as representing mm -hmm. that. Can you talk a little bit about what they do? Well, the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association has 116 member chiefs representing mm -hmm. 116 of the communities here in Connecticut. Uh, it's an organization that um, can tie all of our departments together and mm -hmm. really. Um, serve Connecticut under one umbrella. Mm -hmm. So uh, your Connecticut Police Chiefs is, is very interested in enhancing the relationship between the police uh, and the communities they serve, and in particular, our youth. You know, mm -hmm. our, our youth are our future, and, and strengthening those bonds, as Lieutenant Set said, are uh, you know critical mm -hmm. to, to the future of our state and country. Yeah, I agree. So um, the two of you, we can start with um, with you, Ryan. How do you feel that the collaboration between the police department and probation and the Board of Education and DCF benefits our families in, in I mean, you know, you're, we're talking about the Waterbury community here, but just statewide, how, how does that reinforce um, us helping strengthen families in your perspective. Uh, I think it's an enormous uh, the, the, how, how you can see the, the goal of uh, the collaborative effort of us getting all together around the same table, utilizing all of our resources, all of our contacts and with the same end goal in mind mm -hmm. is to help families and to provide them an opportunity that without this collaboration they probably would not have had. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the fact that we're all able to do that is a, is a great benefit to all of our organizations that we can provide the service to this family and, and you know, hopefully continue to do more down the road and serve mm -hmm. additional people as, once this model's in place. Right, that's wonderful. What, do you have anything to add about just that collaboration between, because you're really, all, all that I'm speaking of are all people that are, are, have their hands on, mm -hmm. the same families. Mm -hmm. So what can you add to the benefits of that? So yeah, so you know, I think it's important to remember that the overarching mission of law enforcement is to reduce crime and the fear of crime in, in all of our communities. And historically, law enforcement's taken a very uh, reactive mm -hmm. position. When a crime occurs, the police respond, and there's usually a punitive measure that results. Um, you know, and we've gone you know, throughout history working under that model. Uh, when community policing really came into play, uh, that model began to change. We began to see that taking a more proactive approach to policing uh, can yield long-term dividends. And a collaborative effort like this with DCF, with probation, with our school districts, uh, with other police departments uh, regionally uh, can, can really pay off where we begin to share information we have on relationships mm -hmm. that we develop with our youth to be able to best serve uh, the needs of our youth, especially those that are at higher risk. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's also important to, to know that no police officer wants to arrest children, mm -hmm. certainly. You know, our, our youth are our future. We want to uh, set them on the best course possible to live a long and healthy and prosperous life. And by giving them the, the proper services uh, at the young age is really our best bet to reduce crime in the long mm -hmm. term. How many years would you say that this community policing and this collaboration has been happening? Well, you know, the current concept of community policing really began to be pushed through the Department of Justice back in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has been steadily developing in our, most of our agencies across the state since that time. Uh, I really want to throw some kudos out to the Waterbury Police Department and Mayor O'Leary, Chief Spagnola, Lieutenant Bissett for running the PAL program that they do. It is a model that the rest of this country should follow. Uh, the uh, what that PAL program provides to the youth of the city of Waterbury is uh, just tremendous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, so Marissa, in your 18 years there at probation, um, you said 18 years that you've been? 16 in probation. 16. Yeah. Uh, how does this collaboration help you with your role with working with these kids and their families? 
So we've been collaborating a lot the past few years. Um, there were grants that came in that afforded us the opportunity to do a lot of work and to create programs together. Mm -hmm. um, we started doing the mentoring program and we do the summer youth employment program. And just with those two, we've serviced I've over 60 kids yeah. um, in, in the past few years and a lot of those kids come back and they want to keep coming back. Initially there there was a little pushback from the kids you know saying I don't know if I really want to be involved with the police mm -hmm. activities league and then they went in there and realized that this is just for fun we're here to, to have fun to engage and, and they saw the police officers on a different level they saw probation on a different level mm -hmm. um, we spend time doing arts and crafts and eating and, and breaking bread with people mm -hmm. it, it's it's such an icebreaker sure. um, we help the kids you know get get the things that they need for school we help them you know get jobs a lot of our kids have actually gone on to get jobs through Police Athletic League, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, Police Activity yeah. League. Um, some of them are working for the city of Waterbury now. Wow. Um, in, and they're, and we keep track and we and we follow the kids. They're working at community restaurants and grocery stores and and all different places. They they're furthering their education. Um, a lot of our kids are overlapped between probation, DCF, the police department, the pal, mm -hmm. and. Um, so collaborating together, we're able to find these common kids and we'll really be able to do a lot for them and their families. It's been a tremendous experience and I, I have seen personally a lot, a lot of growth mm -hmm. in the kids that we've serviced. I don't know if you I completely agree. agree. And, and like, as Marissa mentioned, we realized a couple of years back that we're, we're, we both have the same goal to serve these kids that need us the most. So we combine our services together to, to work hand in hand and uh, we've had a lot of success stories uh, from that collaboration. To work in silos makes no sense when you're talking about you're all touching the same families mm -hmm. and, and getting you know knowledge of the same kids and, and what their issues are and and it's also I think important for them the kids to see that you are all on the same page and that you're all working for their benefit you know working together for them to be healthy. Um, so, which leads me to my next question. So, from what I understand, we're having a send a family to camp. Um, so, we're going to be piloting this program, and it's selective. It's you're identifying the families, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. But this is a collaboration between the Board of Education, um, probation, the Police Department, PAL, and DCF to take families out of their um, toxic environments where they have many stressors and send them for an overnight at camp, which is at Channel Three Kids Camp. Um, Ryan, can you tell us more about the Send a Family to Camp and, and you know, how that's evolving? Yeah, so it's really an exciting initiative. Um, you know, we're glad to be a part of it. Uh, as you mentioned, we've Marissa's been working with the, the team here at PAL and the Board of Ed and working to identify those families that can greatly benefit from this opportunity. Our whole committee had a great outing a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. at that Channel 3 camp, and um, it was my first time there. What a great facility um, in, in, in the, you know, the woods in Connecticut with cabins and with uh, barbecue area and playground and trails and so many things that you know many of these families may or may not have experienced before so I mm -hmm. think you know through these efforts and being able to provide them that weekend away a family experience to have that bonding time to make memories mm -hmm. to do these things that can maybe you know maybe give them time to reflect and we're gonna have so many great resources there that day that day of community partners um, we're gonna have our mounted horse unit come visit that day officers from Powell are gonna be there for the partner programs experience where we could do some activities with these kids and families in the afternoon. So I'm really envisioning just a, a fun filled day of activities, of time to bond with the families, resources available to the families to let them know the things that are there to help support them. And I think at the end of the day, they're gonna leave with that, that message that you know, all, all of our partner agencies, we really care. Mm -hmm. We all have jobs to do, but it, but one thing is that we all care about them and we, we, we're here to help them, to support them, and I think it's gonna be a great experience for the kids and adults. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm looking forward to yeah. that day. Josh, anything you can add as far as, you know, what you hope families take away? So it's Sunday afternoon and they're en route back home. You know, what do you hope that they're, they're feeling at that moment? Well, first off, I just hope they're just are able to relax and kind of relieve the burdens of life and have a really good time and, and really enjoy the activities and the bonding time that they have with their families and, and our service organizations while they're there. Uh, and, and the second talking point that I had is echoing exactly what the lieutenant just said, 
in that I want them to be heading home saying, wow, our community actually really cares about us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these service organizations um, that, are, that are in place do care. And I think it is a great opportunity to just start building trust between our organizations and, and our families. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Marissa, tell us a little bit about um, the selection. Is this just for children or families? And I know that we talked about it being a multi-generational approach um, yes. to involving you know, um, them in this week, this overnight away. Can you talk to us about that? So we identified 11 families, and that was a collaborative effort between probation, the Board of Education, and PAL. Um, and, and, and as well, I'm sorry, as well as DCF, we've been doing a lot of collaboration with DCF liaisons through the schools. Mm -hmm. So we were able to narrow it down to 11 families, and we really wanted to have a backup list in case some of them were not interested. All 11 families right away said yes, um, and they are extremely excited. We let them know that they are able to bring members of the family, d depending on who lives there. We have families that live with their grandmothers. Um, we have grandmothers that are raising their grandchildren. Maybe they have nieces and nephews, and we told them that all generations welcome. Um, so grandma and grandpa could come, mom and dad, all the kids, and the excitement. I could tell you a couple families actually screeching Aww. with excitement because this is such an opportunity for them and we are so, so grateful to be part of it. Because they, I mean, for many of these families, they've never been away, yeah. let alone all together. You know, and, and as we know, it's so expensive to travel and to be able to travel with all household members and have them be welcome and, and have programming in place so that everyone feels like they're really valued. And, and we know that whoever lives in your household is going to affect how you're raised and, and how successful you are. Can you talk a little bit about the vetting process? You know, how, how did you identify these families? I know there was a collaborative of, you know, effort, um, and then that was great because then there's no overlapping. It's not as if we're inviting too many families or, or every group is inviting the same family. How did you decide that, okay, these are the 11 families and this is the waiting list? Well, the DCF liaisons within certain schools, as well as a vice principal of one of our alternative schools, and myself, when we sat down and talked about it, um, we were looking for families who may not have the opportunity otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are families that um, that they've never been camping. They have never they've never experienced the outdoors being in a cabin being all together like that so we we really like we sat down and went through a bunch of families and we said okay who do we think would love this mm -hmm. who do we think could get the most out of it um, who would appreciate the fact that there's going to be a lot of community providers there that they're going to be able to bring home a lot of information yes it's going to be for fun and mm -hmm. yes they're going to be doing a lot of outdoor activities a lot of nature activities but with all the community providers there they're going to be able to come home with a lot more than that mm -hmm they're gonna come home with contacts that they may not have made. And making those contacts in a camp setting where everybody's relaxed and having fun, mm -hmm. they probably won't be as uncomfortable to accept that help and, and to reach out. And it's not a mandate, you know? It and, is not a mandate. And I think, you know, um, Ryan has mentioned and you've mentioned, we have DCF liaisons in the school and we're working on a prevention model, really, you know, trying to put in those supports and services at the front end, you know, when, where families are very vulnerable to becoming involved with DCF so that we can keep those children home because the best place for kids is home whenever safely possible. So I know that our liaisons are working on that prevention model and I'm glad that they were able to, you know, to help you with all of that. Um, and I think that the resources that are there, oftentimes they're mandated to go to this service and that service either by DCF or probation or, um, you know, as an arrest, um, it's it's one of the things that the kids have to do. But it's nice to know that they're going to have these resources for them to choose. You know whether it's a good fit for them. Exactly. Um, so I think that's wonderful. Um, so if we can talk about what the families will experience when when they're there, I, I'll start with you, Ryan, and everyone can just jump in. And I know that um, you know they're going to be transported there. They don't have to. We're we're trying to lift every barrier possible to make it be such a successful weekend that families um, can't help but say yes. You know why why say no? You know even though it might be a little scary for some of them to be in that environment, um, which is not their normal home environment. 
Tell us like the run of show. What can we expect that weekend? So I think just to just to back up a little bit, I think our committee was so excited that we put together a pre-celebration. Yes. So yes. we're going to actually kick things off on the Wednesday before with a pizza party at PAL, just to kind of get everything in order and get the families really excited about this opportunity and make sure that it's a it's a it's a great weekend. And then you know from what we've discussed, it, it looks like just a, a, a busy day from when they get up there and get off the bus. Uh, there's activities planned all morning. There's a huge mm -hmm. pavilion with a barbecue cookout in the afternoon afternoon with all the partners and police officers and families and kids and just having a great time and then that's going to go right into uh, some activities with the, with the uh, partners that are coming with the families uh, whether that be kickball or volleyball or different things outside uh, there's movies planned at night there's breakout groups doing different activities they talked about a play at some point where mm -hmm. they have characters in different parts so it sounds like the channel 3 uh, uh, staff at the camp has really done a, a great job just trying to make sure that I think when, when, at the least when these kids drive home on Sunday, they probably won't make it home. They're going to be sleeping on that bus <laughs> yeah, on the way so back. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> and I think one of the great things about those activities that are planned, like the kickball game, and it's going to be with you know, the teams are going to be mixed, right, with yes. with police and, and probation mm -hmm. and DCF so that they're, the community partners are, are competing a healthy, happy competition um, with one another. Um, with people that they're going to be going back in in that role with when they come back to Waterbury. So I think that that's great. Um, anything that we're missing about that day? I think keeping in line with um, it being the Police Activities League, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for kids who are not necessarily interested in sporting events. Mm -hmm. um, the talent show, a bonfire, um, there's going to be arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. um, I believe... I would, I, what else was there? There was, a, there was a lot of other things that the kids were going to be able to do outside of something physical because mm -hmm. not every kid wants to participate in something mm -hmm. like that. Exactly. Or a parent. You know, there might be a relative or a parent who's not able to participate and but still want to be engaged in this, you know, family strengthening. Exactly. I know I'll be doing an art project with the families so they'll have a piece of art to bring home with them as a collaborated effort. But, you know, we don't want anyone to feel like they, you know, oh, this is too much for me or I shouldn't have come. You know, we want everyone to leave that day feeling like I'm so glad that I did go um, on that. Anything else that you can think of that well, we might be missing? Channel 3 Kids Camp has so many amenities. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one that I personally find exciting is the, uh, they have ropes, a high ropes <laughs> course. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's such a terrific opportunity for those who dare uh, to, to really try to overcome any fears, overcome any personal obstacles. Uh, it's a great bonding experience for mm -hmm. families to, to go through this course. Of course, it's you know, a very safe course to go through, but it, uh, it's exciting to watch the um, thrill of the participants that go through a ropes course at the end and, and the pride that they have in their accomplishments. Mm -hmm. so. I think getting out of the city too in the yeah. beauty of the nature, mm -hmm. I was stunned by the beauty of the mm -hmm. camp. I, know. I did not expect that. And, and the accommodations where they'll be sleeping and, you know, it is really going to be an adventure, um, probably unlike any one that they've ever tried before. And, um, you know, before we end today, you know, I just want to touch upon that please, the, the police chief's camp affords these, ki these kids, and it could be these kids again, some mm -hmm. of these kids to come for a week and to be at camp and to be, um, you know, really meeting these police officers across the state and sharing lunches with them and having a week-long celebration mm -hmm. as opposed to just that overnight. So. I think that any child who participates in this overnight with their family is going to want to come back. And it's so great to know that they're going to have an opportunity to do so if they're identified in their communities. Um, and, and just you know, as we end, I think that it's been amazing to see how the committee has worked together to to alleviate barriers. The things that we didn't even think of would be a barrier for a family, from a water bottle to a sleeping bag to a towel to clothing, um, COVID tests that we want to make sure that everybody's healthy when they come. So um, this has been you know, a great experience, and, and I'm excited about that day. But thank you all for joining us on Doors to Hope and Healing. Thank you. Um, thank you for watching. Now we're going to turn to a video with voices of our kids involved with the Department of Children and Families who are asking us to meet them where they're at. Thank you. I have a story that needs to be told. Before I was placed in foster care, I learned through actions and inactions of others. That I was not worthy of love. That I was not worthy of love. That I was not worthy of love or attention. I learned that my needs are not a priority. 
As a result of that negativity, I experienced insecurity. I want to be accepted by society, but I'm unsure if I have that ability. Teach me through your actions. Teach me through your actions. Teach me through your actions that I deserve to be cared about and treated well. Don't make me feel as if I'm a burden. Remind me that I am here for a reason. That I was brought into this life because I'm strong enough to live it. I'm strong enough to live it. I am strong enough to live it. Show me that my presence is a gift. Try. Try. Try to meet me where I am at. Give to me without expecting anything in return. Because I may be too hurt and angry to express appreciation when you're trying to help me. But trust that one day, one day, one day, I will remember that you gave to me, that you gave to me in this way. Can you meet me where I'm at? Let me be sad sometimes. Give me room to mess up and make mistakes. Because mistakes are opportunities to learn and grow. By forgiving me, you teach me how to forgive. Understand, there will be times I need space from all the voices. The thing that they know what's best for me. What's best for me. What's best for me. Remember that I am not a paycheck. I'm a person. Will you meet me where I'm at? Remind me that my past, my past, my past does not define me, does not define me. Help me learn to be helped. Mentor my thoughts. Encourage my ideas. Challenge my pushbacks. Laugh with me. Cry with me. Have fun with me. Have trust in me. Ask me these questions. What are my dreams? What is my purpose? What are my talents? How can I help others help others? How can I help others? Let me know that you're here to help me reach my goals. And I will become empowered. But first... But first... But first, you have to meet me where I'm at. I long for community and to be connected. Help me with my self-esteem. And help with my other esteem. Which is how I feel about and relate to others. Show me how to see that I am needed in my community and the world. And see how I can make a difference. See how I can make a difference. See how I can make a difference. You have this gift. Share it with me. Share it with me. Share it with me. Remember that I have lived a different life before I met you. A life you may never understand. I am not asking you to solve all of my problems. Just help make sure. Just help make sure. I don't have to face my problems alone. 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 I am asking you. I'm asking you. I'm asking you. I am asking you to meet me where I'm at. Meet me where I'm at. Meet me where I'm at. Sometimes life just happens. Don't worry. Farmington Motorsports will get you back on the road and at a fair price. From towing to tires, emissions to transmissions. Our ASC certified techs do it all. Farmington Motorsports is a family-run business. We're in Napa Auto Center and AAA approved. 
We work on all makes and models from preventative maintenance to major repairs. And every repair is backed by our two-year, 24,000-mile nationwide warranty. When life happens to you, don't worry. Farmington Motorsports. 